Good morning um, here in California. Uh, guten Abend in uh, Germany. Welcome to our Germany California Microgrid Symposium. I'm Mirko Wutzler. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual event this morning. Um, just a little bit about our organization. We are the official representation of German industry and business in the Western United States. And uh, we help companies with market entry. Uh, we carry out trade delegations, trade missions, such as this one this week. Uh, and we help uh, companies with innovation transfer and organize programs that help them with the digital transformation. Um, this is the second event uh, for our German trade mission that we host virtually in California this week. Uh, in our uh, storage dedicated event on Tuesday, uh, we heard about the ambitious goals of California and Germany to decarbonize the grid uh, and what storage can bring to the table to uh, ensure uh, reliability in the grid. Um, however, a mix of technologies is needed to ensure reliability on the one side and then also grid resilience on the other side. And uh, we saw the effects of extreme weather uh, just in the recent past and that there's room for improvement. So we have a, a great lineup of experts this morning and uh, great companies to talk about the latest regarding microgrids in California and Germany, uh, what are proven best practices and cutting edge advances in microgrids that can help with uh, achieve greater resilience. And um, I wanna mention that this project is uh, part of the Renewables Made in Germany uh, initiative and is supported by the German Federal Ministry of Economics and Energy, so as it has broad support in Germany. Um, and we couldn't make this happen with great partners and we're really happy uh, to have, for example, the California Energy Storage Alliance, uh, the Clean Coalition, the Greater Sacram uh, Sacramento Economic Council, the World Trade Center, Los Angeles, Plug and Play Energy in Germany, Trade and Invest as our partners. And, um, I really want to thank them for doing this with us. Um, now I want to um, briefly introduce uh, our moderator, uh, my colleague Emily, who is our uh, director in the Innovation Solutions Department, and uh, she will guide you through the day. And I turn it over to you, Emily. Thank you very much, Mirko. It's a real pleasure to be here this morning and to welcome you all to our symposium. We have a really great agenda ahead of us today um, with some speakers from California and Germany to start off. Then we have some technology pitches from German companies. We'll be able to have some insight in what exciting innovations they're pursuing followed by a really exciting moderated panel. We'll, we'll be exploring the question of how technological innovation can really contribute to this greater resilience. Um, please feel free to ask Q&A in the Q&A, dedicated Q&A button there. We'll be answering questions live as well as in writing. And without uh, further ado, actually, I would like to start with our first speaker, Alex Morris, the Executive Director of the California Energy Storage Alliance, where he oversees organization strategy, policy work, management, and membership. Alex and the California Energy Storage Alliance have been really fantastic partners for this two-part symposium and we're very excited to welcome him as our uh, kickoff speaker and later in the program as well as a moderator for our expert panel. Alex, uh, the stage is yours. Welcome again and thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you, Emily. And hi, everyone. Good morning and guten Abend. Uh, it's great to be here and I look forward to a great discussion today on microgrids. I think this is a very compelling topic that's very relevant around the world, particularly in California. And there's real suffering going on associated uh, in California with public safety power shutoffs, which we'll talk about quite a bit today. Um, if I may, I'll start uh, by sharing um, a few slides today um, so, Emily, tell me if you cannot see this. All good. Okay. We can see the presenter view, actually. Excuse me? We can see the presenter view, the two slides, but... Ah, okay. Hang on. Okay, there we go. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. Well, so welcome, uh, everyone. Um, it's great to be here again. My name is Alex Morris. I'm the executive director with the California Energy Storage Alliance. And I'm excited to share about CISA and what we're doing and how we're involved in microgrids out here in California. 
For those who haven't met us, we hope you'll join um, and check us out. CISA is the voice of energy storage in California. We're about 100 members and we're a nonprofit trade association. So uh, with the help of our members, many of whom are some of the smartest, most sophisticated companies in the world in energy storage, um, we try to have a voice to help California smartly use energy storage in pursuit of its climate goals. As many of you know, California has uh, very lofty clean energy goals, a, a greenhouse gas cap and trade program, and very ambitious efforts to electrify much of its sectors here. And one of the major challenges there is then, is the grid going to be reliable? And if not, how do we help customers? And what are our paths for microgrids? Um, these are the companies that are CISA members. Um, and so I really do want to thank all of them. One of the great parts of my job is getting to work with so many smart companies. And um, a neat part of CISA also is that we have our board companies and our general members and startup members, but we also work with the load serving entities and the folks responsible for running the electric system. And we try to have very uh, productive collaborative relationships with them. And so that includes uh, the department, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Mar Marin Clean Energy, San Jose, the Clean Power Alliance, um, uh, Peninsula Clean Energy and Glendale Water and Power. So we're, we're really working actively with everyone around the state. And just like Germany, California is big and there's a lot of different areas of the state, all of which have different challenges on their electric system. One further reminder about CISA is our mission and the deal we make with our members is to help there be competitive markets, but we don't pick who the winner will be. And I think this is relevant for microgrids. There's a lot of different ways to try to solve the microgrid challenge. And some of it can involve batteries. Some of it can involve longer duration storage solutions. Some of it can involve solar. Um, some of it may involve the use of hydrogen. And so we try to create a tech neutral platform where everybody can compete and the best solution can win. And just to give you a feel for California, and I know Germany is doing a lot of interesting work here too and is truly a leader. Um, we're one of the largest storage markets in the world and we're really just getting started. Um, last summer when California had outages during a heat storm, we only had 200 megawatts of battery storage on our system. That is a teeny amount given California's overall electric system needs of you know, 60 to 90,000 megawatts. Um, in the process though, we have contracted and are bringing many thousands of megawatts of storage online. We'll see 2000 megawatts come online by this summer. And we're also seeing um, a future grid where we just need tons and tons of storage We've made a lot of success with behind the meter storage programs, some of which may be helping in microgrids, like 300 megawatts of behind the meter storage. And CISA helped pioneer that program for the deployment of those behind the meter storage. But that is insufficient given the customer needs out there. And I know we'll hear later from Rachel McMahon at Sunrun, and they're a company that's very actively interfacing with many California customers and seeing the extent of the need for storage and uh, microgrid solutions. So the future is very uh, challenging here in California because the challenges of deploying so much storage are significant and we'll need to have thousands of megawatts deployed every year for 10 to 15 years. Um, one other challenge we're facing in California is that we're now more than ever connected to other states in the Western United States. And so uh, CISA is uh, naturally aware of that and we're looking at how we can work effectively with these other states like Arizona and New Mexico. And I'm interested to hear any German um, equivalents to this challenge, of course, as you guys deal with that quite often. And so we have this new uh, Western Market Insight Service to help us begin our collaboration with these other state entities and utilities outside of California. So with that, I look forward to uh, today's discussion. I'm really pleased to be here and I'm excited for the panel I'll be moderating later where we'll talk about how technology innovation is enabling microgrids and what other barriers there are.
So Emily, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much and back to you. Thank you Thank so you much, Alex. Alex. Yeah. That was a uh, that was a really great intro, and I'm really excited to have our next keynote speaker. Actually, so she already introduced. We have Rachel McMahon who's joining us today. We're really thrilled to have you, Rachel. She's a senior manager of public policy at Sunrun, where she the state level state level policy effort, effort, good good services, capacity, capacity market market participation, market participation, and Thank you so Thank much, you so for, much having for having me. And quickly, Alex, I think you need to mute your microphone. Thank you. All right, excellent. Echo left. Um, so thanks so much, Emily. I'm very excited to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rachel McMahon, and I'm on Sunrun's policy team focused on grid services in the California market. And uh, Focuses, focused on grid services in the California market, so including resource adequacy capacity, distribution level services, grid services, and microgrids. So quickly by way of background, Sunrun is the leading provider of residential solar systems in the United States. And as such, I'll start by saying that our focus relevant to the topic of microgrids and the subject of this conference is entirely customer driven. So we firmly believe that the challenges of climate change, electrification, reliability of energy supply, resiliency during climate events, and aging and increasingly expensive utility infrastructure all have one thing at the center, and that is individual customers and their actions. So customers and communities choosing to supply some or all of their own power are at the center of a fundamental transition away from centralized energy generation and total reliance on utility infrastructure toward a highly distributed system. And we at Sunrun are finding that increasingly residential solar customers are investing in paired energy storage to enhance their own reliability and resilience. Over the past few years, Sunrun has been aggregating solar and storage systems on single and multifamily housing into virtual power plants to provide capacity and other grid services to local utilities to enhance the reliability and resiliency of the local grid. And these applications, as I mentioned, can also provide distribution level services as well as customer services, so backup power and load shifting for the customers. These are truly value stacked applications. Uh, but as Alex alluded to, we still have quite a ways to go um, in the customer sector. So such customer and community driven power decisions and solutions have a huge and largely untapped potential to alleviate several current challenges in California. Challenges that are inherently rooted in the existing centralized utility managed grid. So for example, the current grid and regulatory design cannot sustain the extreme weather conditions that occur on a regular basis in California. And in fact, as we know, that, that centralized infrastructure is and of itself a wild, wildfire risk. Today, the best tool the utility grid has to avoid causing wildfires during extremely dry conditions is to shut off power to large swaths of customers by de-energizing the grid itself. As one data point, on Thanksgiving last year, nearly 8,000 homes lost power during a public safety power shutoff event, and there remains no community level solution to provide power during these events. And as Alex alluded to, this state also has a growing shortage of power supply on the centralized system. About 10 years ago, one of the state's two nuclear facilities shut down, and the second will retire in the next few years. Thousands of megawatts of gas capacity in Southern California on the coast are on a schedule to retire or retrofit, which has been delayed. We can reasonably expect increasingly low hydro production year over year going forward. And as of today, there is a projected need for new generation and storage resources in excess of 7,000 megawatts over the next few years. And the impacts of these shortages were already seen last summer with rolling blackouts for the first time in 20 years. And a significant portion of this power need can be met by central storage, as Alex said, but also by distributed customer sided local solar plus storage. Let me share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Let me try that again. No problem. Does that work? There we go, thank you. Excellent, thank you. 
Um, and customers understand their role here more than ever. So as I mentioned, customers are interested in self-supplying their own reliability and resiliency rather than depending entirely on the utility system. And we're seeing this development throughout the country, in particular as climate change field events become a more regular occurrence, which is what this map shows. And this map is from 2018. Um, so by scale for 2020 and going forward, I think that fire icon would be even larger for California as we're having year over year um, record years. Uh, record fire years. Okay. And the good news is that the cost of solar and storage technology is declining over time. While utility rates and the cost to serve individual customers using util the existing utility system are going up. So the blue line here shows the cost of solar PV going down over time and the green line shows the cost of solar and storage going down over time, whereas the dotted lines show um, electricity rates rising over time. And um, from top to bottom, those dotted lines represent electricity rates in Hawaii, California, and Texas. And a large part of the reason for this increase in utility rates is that the cost of utility infrastructure is increasing over time. So the Edison Electric Institute estimates that by 2030, the electric utility industry in the United States will need to make a total infrastructure investment of between one and a half and two trillion dollars and required transmission and distribution investment of $880 billion. By prioritizing clean local generation and storage and making end use customers a major part of the grid of the future, ratepayers can save billions. Okay. So climate events, power shutoffs, and wildfires are here to stay, thus, as I've said, necessitating a focus on long-term solutions with the customer at the center. Local governments are increasingly interested in customer-sided virtual power plants because of their highly localized benefits. And the grid becomes more resilient and better able to serve vulnerable communities by making those communities stronger and less dependent on the utility system. In particular, by allowing neighbors to share power with each other without the involvement of the utility, communities vulnerable to power outages become stronger uh, and particularly in California, more uh, remote communities too. So Sunrun is advancing a concept in the microgrid policy space that we refer to as the clean resilient neighborhood grid. Um, the neighborhood grid vision is focused on enabling entirely community-driven local grids wherein neighbors share power from their own residential systems, coupled with some amount of on-site clean generation and storage at the distribution substation, so that the community is sustainable in all power system conditions. And Sunrun published a concept paper early in 2020 titled Smart Clean Neighborhood Grids, Redesigning Our Electric System to Help Communities Power Through Blackouts that outline this vision and it's available on our website. Um, but to give you the quick version, the neighborhood grid concept is made by the formation of distributed islands at the substation level with the capability to disconnect and reconnect from the transmission system as needed. At the foundation of the neighborhood grid are solar PV and solar, pardon me, solar photovoltaics and energy storage distributed on homes along distribution feeders and some amount of energy storage and clean generation at the utility substation to energize individual circuits within the distribution network, giving customer sited solar and storage time to energize and island the circuit. When compared to the utility investments, the neighborhood grid provides a lower cost system to build and maintain, provides a clean method to energize specific feeders, and also a reduced potential to contribute to fires sparked by utility infrastructure and the societal and cost burden. Sunrun tested out this concept last summer in a response to a request from regulators to demonstrate alternatives to diesel at specific substations prone to wildfire related shutoffs. Sunrun modeled and presented three scenarios to replace the output from PG&E's Covello substation with the neighborhood grid and found it to be more cost effective than diesel alternatives over a 10 year period and far more valuable as the neighborhood grid provides benefits outside of power disruptions and can provide power um, outside of PSPS times. So this vision also is requiring a significant level of policy development as it brings to light the concept of neighbor sharing power with each other outside of the utility framework. And as I've said, customers are prohibited from doing this today. 
And this is a central point. We are prohibited from leaving the grid and even sharing power with each other. And so far that rule has not changed. And what we have today are regulations that allow for individual customers to provide their own backup power. So scenario three on this slide and for power to be provided to the customer by the utility transmission and distribution system during normal operations. So scenario one, um, under the current framework, customers that do not have technology on site will not be re-energized during power outages and thus will not have access to power. And since there is not currently a way, way to share electrons with neighbors or other customers connected to the same distribution line segment, these solutions do not provide full resilience to those affected by the de-energization of lines in fire prone areas or to weather supply shortages on the system, which we will see again. What is needed is a third pathway wherein customers can remove themselves from total reliance on utility infrastructure and, and communities can become stronger themselves. And that has been the focus of our advocacy. I'm going to stop sharing, there we go. Um, and hopefully you can see me. Uh, however, that vision is not entirely a shared one. Um, so what we're seeing today, particularly in the policy space around microgrid development is a closer adherence to utility control, supporting and enforcing centralized infrastructure and utility perspectives on resiliency and reliability. We have not yet seen true and actual acknowledgement, ac actionable, pardon me, acknowledgement of the fundamental shift that ultimately must occur toward community and customer driven clean solutions and away from total dependency on utility infrastructure. Specific to microgrids, currently a third party uh, like Sunrun must contract with the utility to develop a community microgrid project. And generally that project would be subject to the utility's control. And there is a cap on the number of pro such projects that may be deployed statewide today. And again, neighbors are also prohibited from sharing power with each other based on existing and outdated law and interpretation of that law. And the dispatchable capacity value of our virtual power plant projects is not yet realized. Uh, so finally, um, I've mentioned multiple times throughout this talk, clean generation and storage. This is a crucial element of resiliency and sustainability that must not be overlooked. We are in a climate crisis. And for the first time in history, most people, most Americans agree with this. And deploying anything other than technology that does not emit greenhouse gases cannot be part of a resilient and sustainable framework going forward. Fossil generation may keep the lights on temporarily, but it is not a sustainable solution. In this state today, utilities have no firm directive to invest in or enable clean long-term solutions to community resiliency. We are now in year three of public safety power shutoffs nearly four years since paradise. And as of today, distribution utilities need to do nothing more than sign one year contracts year over year for diesel generation to mitigate supply shortages. There is currently not a firm requirement to develop solutions um, or more that are not more diesels or more utility con uh, controlled infrastructure. Some progress is being made in this direction, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, however, we keep working and we remain hopeful that this paradigm will change going forward as we believe it to be both fundamental and inevitable. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was a really, really fascinating insights there from California. I think I speak for everyone who lives here as well. The experience of energy reliability and resilience is all very direct for us here. And after hearing from the Californian side, from Alex and Rachel, I'm really pleased that we can now welcome a bit more perspectives from the German side as well, as there is a lot of policy overlap and common challenges here. And we're going to start off with a really very quick overview simply from Laura Scharlach, who is the head of the Germany Energy Solutions Initiative at the Renewables Academy, and helping to organize these symposiums as well, and the delegation that goes around them, helping companies um, in Germany connect to markets like California. Laura, um, I think the stage is yours now, if you can- Thanks, join. Emily. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Emily, for introducing me. Um, good morning to California. Um, guten Abend nach Deutschland. Um, I'm happy to be here. It's um, my second uh, virtual AHK business trip to California. The last one was last year, and I'm happy to share my screen just a second. Wait. So, can you sh can you see my screen? 
Perfect. Yeah, okay. So yeah, welcome everybody to the German Californian Microgrid Symposium. My name is Laura Scharlach. Um, I'm a consultant on behalf of the German Energy Solutions Initiative um, funded by the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. And I just want to quickly um, introduce you to this initiative before we go ahead with um, the other speakers. So what is the German Energy Solutions Initiative? Um, the sole initiative uh, facilitates business partnerships in the field of renewable energies, um, energy efficiency technologies, smart grids and uh, storage technologies, um, which is all based on a parliament decision in 2002 with the aim to mainly support small and medium sized companies. So we really focus on the small and medium sized ones, not on the big ones. Um, we want to distribute smart and sustainable energy solutions and of course uh, contribute to international climate protection. This whole initiative is coordinated and uh, financed by the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. And um, I'm working on behalf of, the, um, of this ministry at the Renewables Academy in Berlin. What do we offer? We um, offer several, yeah, several things to Germans and um, to companies abroad. Um, on the one hand, we um, offer information about German energy solutions. Um, we also offer networking and business opportunities with German companies, both in, in this case, uh, the United States and Germany. Um, we do know-how exchange programs, for example, together with the German energy agency, the so-called DENA or the GIZ. And we um, support showcases of flagship projects all around the world. Networking and business opportunities is the biggest part of this initiative. Um, the AHK trade missions, um, which usually take place physically, um, now virtually, of course, due to COVID. Um, it's always, it always contains this one day seminar, the opening conference and um, the individual business meetings, um, which the German companies will have the next couple of days. There are also the foreign trade fairs um, with German pavilions, with German exhibitors, the information forum, and uh, many side events. I think um, you all know the InterSolar um, United States and San Francisco, which um, yeah, which I've also been, and um, there you also usually you also find a German pavilion. Know-how exchange programs. We also organize fact-finding missions to Germany for delegates from abroad, um, where the delegations get first-hand information on energy solutions, different energy solutions um, made in Germany. And uh, we also do on-site visits and networking opportunities. Usually we invite people to come to Germany and we travel through Germany usually like three to five days. Uh, for now, we are doing this via Zoom. And um, same with the German training weeks um, where German company representative like occur as trainers um, and um, train their technology specific uh, projects. And uh, this is usually done and connect, um, conducted by the GIZ, not so much in the United States, more in um, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, information, we have a huge database. Here you see the link to the website. I will also quickly write the link in the chat. It's a huge online database, um, which is available in German and in English. Um, you can find profiles and contact information of German companies. You can search for names, you can search for technologies. Um, it's, it's pretty interesting. It's worth to subscribe um, also to the upcoming newsletter, which comes, I think, once a month. And you can also download um, market studies, information on events, um, records, fact sheets, um, financial fact sheets. So it's pretty interesting. And um, yeah, the website is also available in English. That was it for me. Um, I will be here the entire conference. I will be happy to um, answer your questions in the chat. And um, yeah, hope to see you all like uh, hopefully next year in California. And um, yeah. I'm happy to go back to Emily. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lara, for presenting some of the really exciting opportunities to build this exchange, to build these bridges between Germany and California. I hope you all take the opportunity as well. We are going to be having a technology showcase in a little bit to, if you want to speak to the individual companies, do reach out to us as well. And I did just see there is some Q&A coming up in the Q&A box there. We're going to have a Q&A session right after our next talk. So please write your questions in there. We're going to have a couple of minutes to answer them there.
there. But for now, from the bigger picture and the opportunities to exchange to really the topic of microgrids, we're really excited to welcome our next new speaker, Dr. Zabina Awa, who is the CEO and co-founder of Elena International. And she's built her career around topics such as power grid stability analysis, the intersection with electrical engineering. And she will be talking to, about, to us about microgrids in Germany with a case study of planning German and Swiss energy communities. So Zabina, uh, thank you very much for joining us today and the stage is yours. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Emily. So I start sharing my screen. I'm also very happy to be here today and talk about planning German and uh, Swiss energy communities as grid connected microgrids. And I wanted to start because I, I find it always nice to show faces of our team, including myself, so I was already introduced, I plan to do that, but now uh, this is uh, not necessary anymore. So just shortly about the company, Elena. Elena was incorporated in 2019 in Berlin as a startup. And um, we are working um, on, uh, on, on several topics in, uh, since our incorporation. We started with the topic of microgrids, especially in developing countries. That's where we started out. And there we worked with Microenergy International, for example, um, which is situated in Berlin, but also Renak that was just introduced now. And in the last one and a half years, so we moved more towards known markets for us, this is, which is the German and the Swiss markets, working with um, Swiss and German energy providers, so utilities and grid operators, and also on the topic of planning with connected microgrids. So I divided my talk into two parts. And I first wanted to start out with the bigger picture, talking about microgrids in Germany, some key facts about this topic. And then in the second part, I wanted to move to a more specific use case example and take a really short uh, deep dive into this topic of the uh, business part to be planned as a grid connected microgrid. So microgrids in Germany, I think I, I actually can make the claim are mostly grid connected microgrids. So in the global south, often microgrids are standalone or isolated microgrids. We also just heard in California, this is also um, the ambition to, so that microgrids can be self-sustained and operate um, disconnected from the continental grid. In uh, Germany, what we usually have is uh, tenant electricity projects or business parks and um, in both in both areas, there's great potential for the energy transition since 58% um, of Germans are tenants, which is relatively high compared to other countries. And according to the BMWI, the market potential is around 360,000 buildings, which uh, rounds up to about 11% of our households in Germany and new buildings are not even included. So there's huge potential there for decarbonization. And also on the, on the same side, the uh, business and industry parks of course, there's also some potential. There are around 400 large energy quarters that are planned in Germany every year with the tenancy um, uh, strongly growing. And of course, the themes are fewer, but they bring uh, quite a large energy, energy consumption with them, of course, which then again makes a great potential for decarbonization. On the next slide, I wanted to give you an impression of the stakeholder map um, within tenant electricity projects because there is really a great variety of stakeholders. And I think this is a chance because it's possible to involve many different people and um, get them on board for the energy transition. But it's also a challenge, of course, to um, bring all people or make all people heading into the same direction and agree on a certain project. So we have, of course, the tenants that uh, yeah, live in multifamily houses, the landlords or owners, real estate companies of the, of the houses. Often the investor is a different entity then they, um, these um, stakeholders, they consult usually the energy consultant of the utility to provide um, project development, but also the planning process for the tenant project for them. Then the grid operator needs to be involved um, because of the grid connection that needs to be applied for and need to, needs to be sized and um, paid for. And the municipality is also often involved. So why, why does it make sense for um, the stakeholders to build microgrids and to be interested in the microgrids. So I already mentioned the resilience part is not the main focus at the moment in Germany since security of supply is 
relatively high at the moment. The microgrid development is mainly driven due to high electricity tariffs, um, from my understanding. So Germany has relatively high electri electricity tariffs with up to uh, 30 cents per kilowatt hour for end consumers. The tendency is also that prices are further increasing. So in the beginning of this year, CO2 prices were introduced in Germany. For example, gas prices were rising by 10 cents per liter. So this is quite much. And of course, this leads to self-consumption being more desirable since the local renewable generation with levelized costs of electricity of around 15 cents per kilowatt hour is much cheaper compared to electricity tariffs. Also, there are subsidies in Germany, so there is support for local generation technologies like CHP, for example, and also access photovoltaic and wind generation can be fed to the grid and is rewarded with a feed and, ter feed and tariff, which by now is um, yeah, between five and seven cents um, for business parks, at least. I also wanted to make a short leap to the lessons learned from German microgrids. And I think the first one is not specifically German, but I still wanted to name it. So the last 5% of self-sufficiency are usually the most expensive ones where you need massive uh, deployment of more storage and so on. Investment security and easy contracting model is something that is really important to be given by public regulation. So um, microgrids are kicked off, for example, for a year now. Um, it is possible to hire a contractor in um, in Germany to yeah to be uh, to 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 take the role of the utility for microgrid. Otherwise, as a landlord, you would need to um, apply or or create a business as a utility entity. Also, so that made it easier. But at the same time, investment security is a, a bit of an issue in Germany, at least, which is not the case in Switzerland, because in Germany, tenants can actually easily exit a tenant project, a project which makes it difficult to um, plan for it. At the same time, the taxes and subsidies advance the development in Germany, as I just mentioned, um, due to the cost relations. And there, also in contrast to other European co uh, countries, storage solutions are actually really economic in Germany and can already be integrated. Something that I personally found surprising is that education communication is a big aspect since there are all these different stakeholders. It is really important to talk to, um, to the end customers. There can be architects, teachers, uh, dentists also living as tenants, and they need to be um, taught what are the advantages and disadvantages of certain um, technology mixes, load management, et cetera. So this is quite a challenge for planners at least and microgrid projects. Now I have, uh, I think, three minutes left, uh, just really short to present the case study of a business park. There we work with, um, uh, for example, with Gelsenwasser, and I want to present this um, location of the headquarter of Gelsenwasser, which has five office buildings, there are charging stations for electromobility, and there's quite some geothermal potential. And the goal for Gelsenwasser is to reach high shares of renewable energies. They want to be as self-sufficient as possible. And um, the reason is also that they want this business park to be a showcase for also future customers that want to transform their business parks themselves. And um, for this re for this um, for these goals, they want to identify what are the most fitting key technologies. At the same time, especially this aspect is quite challenging because there's a rapid development of new technologies and um, difficult to decide for the right one. At the same time, the energy transition brings quite a complexity because it spans over the sectors electricity, heat, cold, and mobility. And it includes concepts of storage, but also load management. And an optimal solution needs to integrate all these different aspects and optimize over them when, when, when the planning process is undertaken. Then often data accessibility is an issue. For example, or especially electric vehicle load profiles is something that's puzzling for many planners. And so, um, there's a lot of Excel work being done and um, single-handed expert tools for certain subsystems, which does not lead to um, an optimal solution. So we work with them uh, to, towards a software as a service solution for planning the energy communities and business parks. So they have a modular technology choice, can identify the optimal energy mix and compare different scenarios. This is something we so far undertook as a consultancy project which gave us um, these results. 
which I find quite interesting because their um, mix of uh, technologies is a bit more exotic, for example. So there's solar and wind and the potentials are exhausted and there's geothermal generation. But what I find really interesting, there's also this is actually a fuel cell uh, CHP plant. There's also an ice storage, um, uh, thermal storage um, uh, yeah, capacity included, uh, battery storage, um, which of course is the, the driver of the costs again. And maybe since time is running out, I go to my last slide. Um, of course, we also recorded what's then at the end of self-sufficiency and self-consumption. So these are always the key facts that are interesting for German um, customers and planners. They want to know how self-sufficient are we? What's our self-consumption rate at the end? This is what we uh, put down here with 76% or 90%. And um, with this, I want to conclude the case study. So just so you get an idea how things work with um, business parks in Germany. And I come to the end and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to receive questions. And uh, so I can talk about aspects that I didn't have time to now in the 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabina. That was really interesting, both the wide view on microgrids in Germany and this specific case study. I'd like to invite everyone, please write some Q&A if you have any in the Q&A boxes. Also to the speakers, if you have questions to each other. I am going to start with one question to Rachel from Mark here. Right? Mark was asking, how much do CCAs mitigate the monopoly power of utilities and how are you and are you working with them? Uh, Rachel, you did answer in writing already, but I thought you could maybe speak uh, for sure short um, answer on this verbally as well. Rachel, are you are you there? I think you're still on mute in case uh, you are hearing this. I will quickly otherwise just also read out the answer that you wrote because I find this question really interesting about the CCAs and how they mitigate the monop monopoly power of utilities. Oh, here we go, Rachel. I think, can you hear us, Rachel? Yes, I can. I can hear you now. So perfect. Sorry. Sorry about that. We just, I just wanted to give you the opportunity to answer the question in the Q&A personally as well, because I find a really interesting question about how CCAs mitigate the monopoly power of utilities and how you are working with them and if you're working with them. Sure. Um, so it is a good question. So we are working with CCAs on the virtual power plant projects that I mentioned. So actually um, providing grid services, providing uh, capacity to local areas. However, specifically for microgrids, the investor and utilities still control the distribution infrastructure and they still control the wires. So for um, so for issues such as, you know, allowing customers pr to provide power to each other or having true competition in microgrid development, that's still very much in the hands of the investor and utilities. Um, and they still control that piece. And another part of my answer was that um, because the utilities are losing so much of their retail load mm -hmm. to CCAs, they are even more sensitive um, or even, how do I say this? They're focusing even more on their traditional wires business, meaning that they're even more sensitive than they have been in the past mm -hmm. to what they perceive to be a threat um, to their control of their own system. So it, while there is a lot of potential, um, the current environment makes it even harder um, to push against the utilities, so. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm, thank you very much for that answer. And perhaps a really quick fire one, just because it's related to CCAs. And I have another question for Sabina here. But why are CCAs not used on a small and mid-level commercial business level? So, sorry that I, I have to admit, I'm not so firm with this aggravation, actually, CCAs. Oh, it's community <laughs> choice aggregators. And I think perhaps, sorry, Zabina, there's another question that's going to you in a second. But this, perhaps, Rachel, you want to speak quickly on the CCA question. Why are CCAs not used on small and mid-level commercial business um, level? Um, I believe that they, I, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. I believe that they are. Um, so CCAs are essentially, they are, 
<coughs> by way of a bit of background, they are a, um, a, a local government entity. So a local government will decide to uh, bound to, get, to, to create an entity that can purchase power on behalf of uh, end use customers. And then a certain number of end use customers will sign up um, but I'm not aware that customer classes, like commercial customers are prohibited from, pro from getting power from CCAs. I believe that they can. So I'm not, not entirely sure I understand the question. No, I think that's a good answer probably. Maybe Frank, if you have any more questions or want to elaborate on that question, you can also type in there and uh, see if Rachel has a different answer for you then. The one quick point I want to Zabina before we go on to our technology so showcase is actually, um, if you know off the top of your head, what cost per watt is needed for building integrated solar at 36 to 48% efficiency of conversion? It's a very technical question. So do feel free to say that you want to answer that later, but just wanted to ping it to your direction. Mm -hmm. um, actually, so I was reading it in, in the chat. I was wondering what is meant with building integrated. So if this is uh, about something specific, I can say that we um, at the moment calculate with uh, 2000 euros per kilowatt, so per kilowatt. Um, and uh, this, this works for the German and the Swiss projects, but maybe you meant something more specific with building integrated. So I'm not sure if I correctly answered your question. I think that gives a good answer for Nazabina. Mark, if you want to elaborate, please again feel free to the Q&A and the speakers can and will answer through the written Q&A as well. So thank you so much again to all our keynote speakers and speakers really giving us a great overview over Californian and German microgrid landscape. And I am very excited for the next part of our symposium here, which is our technology showcase where four German companies will be pitching and presenting their technologies. And I'm very excited to start with Easy Smart Grid and Thomas Walter, the managing director who will present to us his technology. Thomas, are you there? I'm here, can you read me? Perfect. Wonderful. So thank you, good morning uh, to uh, all the audience in uh, California. Thank you also for uh, having me here and uh, the speakers, particularly um, Sabine, who showed some of the challenges in planning uh, uh, smart microgrids. Um, let me just switch to full picture mode. So basically, what I want to tell you about is our role in the smart transition to 100% renewables. So just as a teaser, this is a slide that shows where we come from. So uh, big technology, remote control, complex systems, and that's where we want to go to. A renewable world where you have thousands and even millions of uh, actors in the system which you want to coordinate in a similar way uh, that uh, swarms of birds are doing uh, something collectively which benefits all of them. So. What is our role and what's our uh, vision in this, in this game? So basically we are uh, focusing exclusively on a future energy system that will be supplied by renewables. Of course, there may be other uh, interim uh, formats. Uh, our scope, our concrete uh, contribution to that system is the reduction of cost of storage and the reduction of system complexity and with a reduction of system complexity, it's also the cost of the information communication technology to run such systems. So for the first uh, activity area, uh, we focus on customer flexibility and we uh, transform flexibility into what we call virtual batteries. Actually for the grid, they have the same purpose. There's no difference between a real and a virtual battery uh, in view of the energy system, but they're much cheaper. The second part is, of course, most of these flexibilities are owned by customers and customers, and how can we integrate them into the system and have them take an active role in an efficient and a simple, but also a system supportive way. And of course, um, as I've tried to show, um, we only have a small part in this, and therefore we need to develop sustainable partnerships with other actors in the system in order to move things forward. 
So you know all this. This is the current situation in California, the famous California duck and the uh, time of use tariffs uh, to fight them. Now, this is just a snapshot. This is just the past. And this is going to move on and on and on. And our technology is about helping to evolve the energy system into the future with even higher shares of renewables, with customer devices that act automatically so you don't need to change behavior, uh, with decentralized options like microgrids that we are discussing. So not only on a, on a, on a large state system, but also on smaller systems. Uh, to enable a, a, a triple win of customer benefit, which means cheaper energy, um, low system cost and resilience, of course. Now, just to give you a small insight into what we mean as a virtual battery, if you look at the generation profile in yellow, some PV and in blue, some wind energy, and in red, you see a typical consumption pattern of uh, household uh, devices, that's the picture from Europe, um, you see a mismatch and you have two ways of solving that mismatch. Either you buy a battery and you store energy when you have it and you uh, discharge a battery when you use your energy in the evening or you shift the consumption from the evening to the daytime when uh, energy is available. Now, Basically, this washing machine is a virtual battery, and it has the same function without the additional investment that you'd otherwise need. Now, we demonstrate this in Germany, and as Sabine said, Germany and Switzerland, so it's on the border to Switzerland on the German side. Uh, you see Lake Const in the background. That's a newly developed microgrid with um, uh, 22 households, and I'm not going into all of this. You can see there is PV on the roof. They don't have wind generation. Uh, they have uh, heat pumps uh, for each of the 12 semi-detached houses. They have a co-generation unit. They have electric vehicles. Um, they have even flexible household devices. And the challenge that we are addressing there is the coordination of all these actors in a swarm for maximum benefit. Uh, we all... I'm not going into too much detail of this. This is a simulation of a typical spring day and the heating, um, the generation of PV, the generation from your co-generation unit, the operation of heat pumps. On the left-hand side, the traditional operation. On the right-hand side, you see that the heat pumps shift their operation to the time when solar is available, and the co-generation unit shifts its time away to those times when solar is not available to fill the gaps. Um, as a result, um, what you implement is a real-time price signal to which the customers react, which allows to include a number of devices, particularly important are heating and mobility electric vehicles, because in Germany, that's two-thirds of primary uh, green, uh, energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. The contracts are very simple. The uh, communication infrastructure is very simple. Um, and of course, the way we do it increases resilience. We are not optimizing at the moment for 100% self-sufficiency. There still is an exchange with the grid. Uh, but we reduce that, and therefore we reduce grid load. Now, why would that be relevant for California? Um, Probably you might have similar houses, but, but you might have different ones. There's a lot of potential that you can use in water infrastructure. There's a lot of potential as virtual batteries in cooling applications, whether it's for cold storage or buildings or computer centers. Of course, that has been mentioned electric vehicles, particularly when they're standing there for a long time. So they are flexible when they charge. Uh, whenever you have local or district heating systems or cooling systems to which heat pumps typically are connected, they can be flexible. And in all these cases, our technology is about orchestrating all this flexibility as much as possible to the pattern of renewable generation. Thank you. That is what I've prepared. And I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussions afterward. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. That was a really great uh, presentation. And I would like again to point your attention to the Q&A. There's already a question for you, which you can answer live by typing as well. And please do ask questions in the audience if you want to know. We're also very happy to make contact to any and every of the speakers and companies presenting here. Um, and if you'd like a meeting, please do let us know. We are going on to the next speaker now and the next technology pitch. And we're very excited to welcome Sun Oyster. And there, I believe Tim Zenningen will be speaking and presenting for Sun Oyster. Yes, hello everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Tim Zenningen. Um, I'll be presenting a quick um, 10 minute overview of um, what our, our idea is. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can you see this okay? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so Sun Oyster is the next step in the evolution of clean energy as we see it. So by combining um, concentrated solar and photovoltaic. And uh, that's the core. So meaning that, um, that we're trying to combine or we're combining three major pillars to make the Sun Oyster as efficient as it is. Uh, one is utilizing uh, cheap uh, or low cost mirrors for concentrated solar for creating thermal energy. Then the second is um, adding bi-axial tracking. So the core pillar of concentrated photovoltaic, uh, which is then used for both uh, thermal, creating thermal energy and uh, electricity at a higher efficiency. And the third one is then combining the, um, the mirrors with photovoltaic, uh, making it more modular and cost efficient by on the one hand, uh, including a receiver for the thermal or for the, for the mirror system um, that includes photovoltaic modules, but then also the, uh, giving the ability to attach a regular standard photovoltaic modules um, along at the same system, which can then also use a bi-axial tracking. Um, and that's one of the core pillars of the Sun Oyster, so the bi-axial tracking, uh, which sets us apart from some of the competitors in the market. Um, and that's where um, that's one of the core pillars how we um, are reaching the efficiency. And then the mechanics that I used to to track uh, to to help the system track are also then used to um, float it down, and that's where the name comes from. So it can float itself, uh, similar as an oyster. Um, that's used for multiple purposes. One, um, in case of strong wind, so that it's protected from the elements then from strong wind. It's also then making it easier to get uh, low calculations, meaning that once it's closed down, there's no uplift effect. So it's just the weight of the system itself. Um, it's been tested at very high wind. Uh, some of the installations in Germany have uh, experienced uh, strong storms over the last couple of years and uh, hold up without any issues. So it's on the one hand protecting from high wind. On the other hand, it's uh, closing every night. So it's protecting then the receiver of the system and the mirrors so that uh, there's no un not unnecessary dirt, et cetera, that can settle on these components. And then the main goal that we have with the Sun Oyster is to increase efficiency, meaning that um, if you have a specific surface and just install photovoltaic, which is good, cheap, and scalable. Um, but you have the problem that about 80% of the solar radiation is going to waste because the average efficiency of good uh, PV modules is at around 20%. That's where we are turning it around, meaning that the Sun Oyster, um, fully optimized, is getting close to 80% uh, efficiency. So it's getting close to 80% um, of the um, sun into electricity and heat. And the table on the right hand side shows um, how you how we're comparing the numbers. So for a specific footprint, the photovoltaic would be installed, uh, we can almost get three times or then almost four times as much um, electricity out of the same area by using the Sun Oyster PV Plus, which uh, you can see on the animation on the left side. So the Sun Oyster PV Plus is then the Sun Oyster with the mirrors combined with additional um, PV modules um, attached along it. And that's where then the efficiency for the PV modules also kicks in uh, by allowing um, the tracking. 
And then coming a little bit more into the technical details, what you can see here is a slide um, about the receiver that's installed in the system. So that is then getting the concentrated solar from the mirrors. Um, glass lenses that are mounted on top of it are funneling um, the sun then towards um, high efficiency solar modules um, at 44% efficiency. Those are the same models that are used in aerospace and satellites, et cetera. And at the same time, which you can see on the bottom left, um, there is an aluminum tube mounted within the receiver where we have a specific liquid then being passed through that uh, serves for two purposes. One is it's lowering the temperature of the PV uh, modules inside, uh, inside the hybrid receiver. So therefore increasing their efficiency even more. And on the other hand, we can then use the um, additional uh, thermal heat to um, then gain the maximum power output of the system. So that's used for hybrid applications where electricity is needed along with the thermal energy. Uh, we also have a um, pure thermal receiver. So instead of installing the hybrid, um, we would then install a thermal receiver, which is um, a black coated pipe with, with a glass protection. And that with, uh, with our Sun Oyster 16 version. So the 16 meaning it has uh, 16 square meters of mirror surface can get up to 12 kilowatt of thermal heat. Um, and that's about 75% of what um, the maximum thermal, maximum theoretical output for that surface area would be. Um, a couple of possible applications then depend on whether the hybrid receiver is installed or the heat receiver is installed. So the hybrid receiver, because photovoltaic is in the mix, can only get up to 110 degrees uh, Celsius, so to protect the PV modules. However, the pure heat receiver can get up to 170 Celsius. Uh, and that then opens up a couple of uh, possible applications specifically um, in commercial area where the hybrid model is also designed for, uh, to be applied in the residential area. Um, so the 110 degrees can then, in a storage tank, um, using heat exchangers being used for warm water, domestic warm water, or room heating. Within the commercialization applications, it spans uh, through a lot of different uh, possibilities, so from desalinization, and then one um, other applications would be then cooling using uh, chillers or um, being used within steam plants uh, for preheating of those. I've mentioned before, so there's a Sun Oyster 16, that's uh, 16 square meters of mirror surface, but our new model, that's a Sun Oyster 8, which is an iteration, also 16, and uh, the focus there is to get it more scalable by having a smaller size. Um, the installation, is, is about half the time. However, it's lo logistically a lot easier to get uh, the part chipped and, uh, uh, and then also installed. And offers a couple of more advantages. So it's, it's a lot lighter, less, way less than half the weight of the Sun Oyster 16, so allowing uh, roof installation, a lot more easy. And it also allows um, a better maintenance schedule by having all moving parts enclosed uh, within an enclosure. Um, so that's enclosing the ring profile, that's enclosing the motor, the gearbox, et cetera, so that it's uh, more protected from the elements. And then on the bottom, you can see a summary of the power output. So for the Sun Oyster 8 again, we have the heat version. So that produces up to 5.5 kilowatts of thermal energy. And the, then the hybrid is again 5.5, but it's broken down in thermal and electricity um, by the production of the receiver. Both versions can then be added um, as a PV plus version with uh, standard PV modules. So that's uh, additional four modules that can be installed to get up to 1200 watts. And then last but not least, we also have the Sun Oyster 8 PV Pure. It's using the same technology for tracking, so also biaxial tracking. Um, but it is uh, then just for PV modules, standard PV modules, as you can see here. 12 modules is what uh, it's designed for to hold. And uh, so therefore can go up to 4.8 um, kilowatt. And then uh, to close this out, just wanted to show a couple of images of uh, reference installations that we have in place. So we have a variety of Sun Oysters um, already installed. Some of them since several years have been operating smoothly. 
um, so some of them in Germany or in Europe and in, in Belgium, um, but also some of them in China, where then on the top right, what you can see there is um, one of the projects we're working on right now, where 100 sun oysters are being planned uh, to produce um, heat only in that case for um, steam generation at a pharmaceutical company. Right, um, so closing this out, saying thank you, Shun. And uh, what you can see here is just a picture of um, two additional models that have been installed in China a few years back um, that are being used in a school to produce domestic warm water. Thank you, Tim. That was really great to see and really exciting to see some innovation in the solar field. And that's exactly where we're going to be continuing now, actually, with our next company and next technology pitch from solar oysters to a solar film. We're now going to hear from Heliatech from Nicholas Ibarra. So thank you very much again, Tim, and passing on to you, Nicholas. Hi, Emily. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias, wherever you are in the world. Uh, just give me one second. I'm just going to share my screen here. And I believe you should be able to see that, correct, Emily? Perfect, yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very happy to be part of this um, virtual business trip to California. Uh, it's unfortunate that we couldn't really join everybody um, face to face, but hopefully we can do that again in the near future. But uh, I wanted to kind of start off with just a, a brief overview about California and kind of one of the focuses for Heliotech. Uh, there's a challenge and a great opportunity at the moment because uh, state legislature is mandated that most buildings across this uh, great state uh, meet energy use and efficiency standards. So that encompasses hundreds of thousands of buildings, either state-owned or local government buildings. But just taking a step back, Essentially, what are some of the drawbacks of existing technology um, when it comes to the conventional solar PV? Uh, we all know that it's heavy, it's rigid, sometimes it's difficult to integrate. Uh, you do need a specialized labor at times. And in all honesty, it does create a significant, significant environmental impact at the end of life. So those are just some of the drawbacks. Um, the other reason why Helitech really exists is that we take a case in point like San Diego. There's so much unlocked potential when you see this image. We have old residential buildings, we have facades, we have non-straight rooftops, lightweight industrial buildings with so much billions of square meters or square feet, wherever you're from, of unlocked solar potential. So it's just sitting there, not being used. So what have we done? So I wanted to talk about the, the USPs basically from Heliotech. And the first one is the ultra lightness. Oh, there we go. So we created a product called uh, Heliosol, which is applicable to different types of buildings. Uh, and just like I said, it unlocks different types of solar applications. The conventional solar PV modules sometimes weigh between 15 to 20 kilograms. The low weight of our product actually makes it easy to install, to transport, uh, and to manage. So, Another great USP from our side is that we are a truly green product. Uh, at less than 10 grams, uh, there is no rare earths. We are OPV, so an organic photovoltaic. So uh, when it comes to the end of life, it's very easy to dispose, no toxic materials. We use one gram of organic material per square meter. So it's a very, very environmentally friendly. And there's easy installation. Sorry, my computer is just freezing up a little bit. There we go. Uh, it's easy to install to any type of surface. Like I mentioned before, it's easy peel and stick. Uh, you don't need any sort of supporting structures. You don't need to drill into anything. It's easy to handle. And I'll show you guys a video uh, towards the end of how it's actually installed. And it takes less than two minutes to install our solar OPV. Um, and we do have a backside adhesive, which sticks to different types of materials from metals, concrete, glass, or bitumen. And if there's any sort of surfaces that are new to us or might be requested from a client or a customer, we always take a look at that and we always do testing here. And it's ultra thin. The great thing about the organic layer is that it's literally just um, less of a thickness of a human hair. 
uh, which makes it very advantageous when installing this product. As a finished product with the junction box as well, uh, it's less than two centimeters. Uh, so it's very light and easy to handle. And here's some highlights of some of the projects that we've done. Uh, we've worked with many uh, different types of partners globally from Axiona in Spain, where we installed 120 solar films on a solar uh, wind turbine. Uh, in France, we work with uh, NG, uh, installing one of the largest OPV installations to date uh, at a school in La Rochelle, France. And here in Germany, where we go where conventional PV can't go, where we can install our solar films basically right onto the facades of a building. And some of our partners like Samsung, where we installed uh, over 160 square meters of Helios L modules onto a gangway between two office buildings uh, near Seoul. And let me just give you guys a short clip here. Hopefully you guys are able to hear the video or hear the audio. That's our headquarters here in Dresden, Germany. Uh, yeah, that kind of concludes a little bit of the presentation. We're more than happy to hear from anybody who might have questions or wants to maybe do a follow-up meeting. Uh, we can get into more technical details, um, but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please send us a message, follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Um, and again, thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was great to see and also nice a little audio um, section there at the end. So again, we're very happy to make introductions here and very excited to have our next and final technology pitch actually coming up right here. Thank you so much, Nicholas. We will be, again, providing the opportunity for everyone to get in touch with all of our companies presenting here. Our next speaker is going to be Ahmed Zahur from the company Frecon. They're really excited to have you present uh, to us as well what you're doing, Frecon. Um, and Ahmed, the stage is yours. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Just we're seeing the presenter view right now. So uh, can you see it? it? Yes, but the presenter view, so we see the next slide as well, just in case. Um... Yeah, yeah, so, so that's fine. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. The picture you're seeing in front of you is actually a cream of uh, green energy enthusiasts or uh, smart grid uh, lovers. So in that picture, you can see that uh, all the renewable generators uh, in the form of like wind turbines and the solar PV panels are connected to a magic box like here in the center, this inverter. And uh, then there is a battery storage. It could be lithium, flow batteries, ultra capacitors, you name it. And then it is connected to a hydrogen electrolyzer providing hydrogen for either for the grid services, the gas services, or the transportation. And then it is communicating bi-directionally with the grid and at the same time bi-directionally can charge the electric vehicles. And at the same time providing power to the load. This drone view that is uh, in front of you is not the future. It is the present and I would say it is the past and Freecon, we are providing this technology for the last five years. Hi, my name is Ahmed Zahur and I'm business development manager at Freecon Gambeha. And uh, we are the manufacturer of power converters and complete provider of best solutions, uh, battery energy storage solutions for, uh, for large scales. Yeah. 
We are situated uh, in the north of uh, Germany, like uh, 200 kilometers from the city of Hamburg. And uh, we started our business from in the 90s and uh, basically coming from the wind sector. And up till now, approximately 45 gigawatt of installed power uh, throughout the world relies on our technology. As mentioned, we like uh, we deal in different segments. So in grid and storage, battery to grid converters, statcoms, UPS, and wind energy, uh, wind converters, pitch systems, solar hybrid inverters, and in microgrid complete solutions uh, involving all hybrid inverters, including energy management system and everything. So the magic box that I discussed in my first slide is actually our universal converter, which we say is like multi-source converter. So what is so special with it is it's actually a combination of AC, DC and DC, AC, DC inverters and uh, DC, DC boosters or converters. And for each load and source, we have a separate DC, DC booster for this. And with the on, on top of it, we provide with every uh, each of our like power converter at a special energy management system, which is also very robust and can do all applications related to battery storage or microgrid or you name it. We yeah. So how can we be like how I'm saying like you can integrate every sort of battery, every sort of source or load. So you can see it's like our voltage ranges are from like theoretically zero volt DC to 1500 volt DC. That's the maximum like currents can go to like more like than like 10,000 amps and project specific energy management system, grid forming, grid falling converters. We are also the sole distributor of Mercedes-Benz energy uh, batteries. So they are, they are like uh, the safest batteries available in the market. So they are fireproof in vibe, like they are robust. They are coming in the fireproof and crashproof automotive casings. And uh, yeah, they are safe as low as we have seen like uh, many fire incidents in the past years uh related to battery storage so if there is a very like uh if there's a very uh uh you can say it's like a safety requirement higher safety requirement so these are best suited on top of it uh, we also offer our own battery solution with our own energy management system and uh, BMS battery store uh, battery management system and uh, the solutions can go from like 0 0.25 C to 20 C. So for and even more C levels that uh, we also provide uh, solutions with ultra capacitors. Yeah, so as I mentioned, ultra capacitor, we also provide uh, solutions that help in improving the power quality of uh, the industrial grid and also the utilities and uh, they can range from like one second to of course from hours so as you can see so it, uh, it is for voltage dips micro interrupt interruptions and yeah harmonics yeah this is uh, the single line diagram of uh, of the very of my very first slide so you can see it's like there's one converter so it would be connected to uh, diff, so like from solar to so DC DC inverter and then the battery a DC DC converter there could be also winds from like AC to DC and then and uh, then like hydrogen you can produce and at the same time you can charge and cars and communicate uh, like bi-directional charging yeah it, this could be like on grid and off grid so our products are top quality uh, very long lasting more than 20 years is our uh, design life and uh, the spare parts are available throughout the globe yeah references toward the globe so one uh, so we are also uh, very much uh, into uh, very innovative projects uh, throughout germany and also in europe so one of the projects I wanted to discuss is uh, it's like e-highway projects in Germany. So it's like uh, uh, like in 
or to say uh, light trains that work with the overhead lines. So in Germany, there are three projects uh, that are uh, that the government is sponsoring to test uh, trucks uh, connected with overhead lines. So this pro uh, this project is a bit special, in which uh, uh, in which like okay the trucks run on electricity, but uh, they're braking when they brake they. Uh, send the energy back to the grid and this is stored in the batteries and uh, the energy is coming from the renewables like you can see like the solar and uh, there we have uh, at many uh, at a particular distance we have our power converters and uh, power converters with storage to support this grid. This is uh, one of our project uh, where we supplied uh, UUPS so like ultra capacitor based solutions for uh, an automotive company. So in order to mitigate its micro interruption and voltage dips and uh, after installing this solution, it produced the company produced like 900 more units per year. These are our references and our partners uh, throughout the world. And uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, this is our contact details. And uh, we are also, we have also opened uh, an office in California right now. And uh, Mr. Jose deals uh, with our products in that office. And uh, it would be great if you contact him or you can write me an email or contact us anytime. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ahmed. That was really great to see as well. And um, we do have a couple more minutes here uh, for any questions to our technology showcase and our technology pitches. So um, I would like to actually here take a question. Oh, let me see here in the Q and A. So a lot of them have already been answered, but um, I'd like to ask actually, Nicola, since you are still typing your answers there, I would like maybe to ask about your panels there, but how resilient your panels are to extreme weather. If you want to answer that live. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had some some technical issue trying to answer that. Uh, my apologies uh, for not getting quick enough on there, but uh, we've done projects over 30 projects, probably close to 40 projects and uh, work globally. So we've done every types of weather conditions from Dubai to uh, work in Singapore and subtropical weather to northern areas here in Germany and across Europe. So they're quite resilient. We actually still have some pilot projects still going on even after five years where the panels are still giving uh, energy and efficiency. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, if there are any more questions, please write them or here we have here for Helia Tech as well. Um, what are the standard module sizes and wattage outputs? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, so the standard size for this year uh, is basically, um, I'd have to convert into inches, but 436 um, millimeters by two meters, essentially. So it's a longer uh, piece, and that's our focus for, this, for the product for this year. And the wattage uh, will be between 50 and 55 watts. Great, thank you. I think that concludes the questions for Heliotech as well. Um, I am seeing here a couple of questions about future viewing. We're gonna be sending out an email to all the participants as well with the presentations as PDF, as far as we can share them and happy to share the content here of the actual um, press symposium. So thank you so much again for your questions. It was really exciting ones. If you want to read through the answered questions, the answers, they're really insightful as well for all of our key technology pitches. And we're really happy to make the connections again to these German companies. It's a really exciting opportunity to collaborate uh, transatlantically and really bring forward the portfolio on microgrids and increasing reliability and resilience. With that, we're about to start another exciting part of our symposium here with a 
panel discussion. And I'm really excited to present and announce a really expert panel we have gathered here together. We're going to be, it's going to be moderated, moderated by Alex Morris, who you've already met before as executive director of CISA. So Alex, if you want to turn on your video as well and unmute yourself. And Hi, thanks, Emily. Thank you thank so you much. much. I believe, I believe you'll, you'll be introducing all the rest all of the rest of the panel. panel. I am, yeah, great, thank you. I'm always a little an echo here, but I'm just gonna say the names as I say the names, do please unmute yourself or at least turn on your video before unmuting yourself. So we have Zabina Awa who will be joining us for the panel. CEO and co founder of International, we've already met. We have Craig Lewis so as well, please turn on your video, founder and executive director of the Clean Coalition. Then we have Stephanie Tannenhaus, who is the principal regulatory analyst at East Bay Community Energy. Carrie Bentley, the CEO of Gridwell Consulting, and Josh Mozzie, Senior Manager of Grid Edge Innovation at Southern California Edison. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion to bring together perspectives from California and Germany, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much. And Emily, do I have an echo? Not now, no. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, well, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks to our panelists for joining us, uh, Sabina, Craig, Stephanie, and I think, can we get Carrie Bentley up on stage? If on stage one, is maybe one the second, wrong. I'll be doing that. One second. Okay. And then also Josh. Well, so we don't have much time, everybody. So thanks. We're going to jump into it. And again, my name is Alex Morris. I'm the executive director with the California Energy Storage Alliance. And um, I look forward to uh, facilitating some quick discussions about microgrids, where and how technology is helping them or not, and what other barriers might be. So the objectives of this panel are to help the audience clearly understand where and how technology innovation will help microgrids in California and Germany as well as to identify what other non-technology changes, policies, or drivers could be considered to help enable microgrids where appropriate. So we're gonna jump into it, but I'm not gonna take the time to introduce each of you. Instead, I'd like to give you a prompt question so that all of our panelists can um, react. And when you react, I'd like to you to also um, introduce yourself and say why you're an appropriate speaker here. So, the opening statements I'd like, and Craig, if it's okay, I'll pick on you first, um, will be, who are you and why are you here? And then what is a single very important innovation that would be needed to enable microgrids where appropriate as you see it? So Craig, let's start with you and then we'll go to Carrie and then Stephanie. And Stephanie, if I can, for some reason it looks a little backlit and that may be on my computer, but I'm not sure if there's a way we can see your face a little more. Okay, go ahead, Craig, thank you. Super. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, so I am Craig Lewis, the executive director of the Clean Coalition. And the Clean Coalition is a nonprofit with a mission to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid. And we've been in existence now for about 12 years. I, I founded the organization back in um, uh, 2009. The reason that the Clean Coalition is relevant to the conversation today is, is we do a lot of work, both in terms of, of um, demonstration projects and also in terms of policy action around enabling clean local energy, which you know has lots of names, distributed energy resources, uh, microgrids, community microgrids, solar storage, et cetera. Uh, and we, we, the Clean Coalition specifically does a lot of project work, demonstration project work around solar microgrids and community microgrids. And I was, I was very pleased that Rachel McMahon uh, highlighted the difference between those things. The solar microgrid is behind the meter, serves a single entity, and a community microgrid really leverages the, the backbone of the distribution grid and serves an entire grid area, distribution grid area, a neighborhood or a community. Um, and the Clean Coalition actually uh, coined the term community microgrid, and I, I, I own the, the, uh, the, the, the domain name 
uh, the, the, the uh, domain names for those, the URLs for those uh, domain names, which, uh, which I, I got, I secured about uh, seven years ago. And it's great to see that that, that uh, terminology is really coming to, to bear. So uh, the reason that the Clean Coalition is here is that we're deep in the middle of the microgrid world, uh, both from a project side and a uh, policy side. And the innovation that is really necessary uh, to, to leverage further is what the Clean Coalition refers to as value of resilience and making sure that uh, people understand that, that, that loads don't have equal values. In other words, when you look at a particular facility or when you look at a particular grid area, loads have different values. For example, at your home, your refrigerator, your communications are probably the top two uh, uh, loads. Those that we would call those critical loads or tier one loads. You never want your refrigerator to go off. That's probably your most important load. If you're anything like me, you wanna make sure that you can survive and have something to eat uh, for the weeks and months to come if the grid doesn't, you know, if the grid goes off uh, for long duration. Um, tier two loads, probably your communications, making sure you've got access to the internet, et cetera and making sure that you can keep your computer and your phone charged up, right? So those are communications related loads and everything else. And so those are tier twos, those are priority loads. You'll keep those on as long as you can without threatening the ability to keep your tier ones on. Um, believe me, you're gonna wanna be able to eat more than you're gonna wanna be able to talk to people or communicate over email. Uh, so, you know, there is a difference between a tier one load and a tier two load, but tier two loads can be kept on for vast majorities of the time. And then tier three loads are everything else. And they're, they're actually the majority of the loads. And I was really glad to see that Sabina had talked about the, the, the cost of keeping on kind of the, 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 the she, she used the term the last 5% of your loads is really expensive to keep that on. So really the, the, the trick is that you, you, you put proper value on your loads and you don't worry about keeping the last 5% of your loads on. You, what you worry about is proper load management to turn those loads off if they're gonna threaten the ability to keep your tier one critical loads on. I'll leave it at that that's, and I know no, we're- That's sure. great. Um, I really like that. And I'm hoping the panel can start to react to one another's points. So Craig, I think a really key distinction for a smart debate and discussion on this is that tier one, two, three concept where one being really critical loads that a customer needs and two um, still a high priority and then three being um, discretionary. Excellent chart showing there. Thank you. Yeah, and I just, um, I, if you give me another 30 seconds, I'll talk through this. So this basically shows that for a typical solar microgrid that's designed in California, and this one was designed for University of California, Santa Barbara, which is in the middle of California, right along the coast at UCSB. Uh, major research university here in California. Uh, so basically, if you do a solar microgrid the way that the Clean Coalition designs them, we can keep 10% of the loads on. So the vertical axis is percentage of load. We can keep 10% of the load on forever, forever, right? We'll never go down. Um, so it's 10% uh, of the load for 100% of the time. Another 15% uh, uh, of the load, what we call tier two loads, those can be kept on for at least 80% of the time. Uh, so you can see the tier two load here, it's 15%. You keep it on for at least 80% of the time. And the rest of the loads can be kept on for a vast majority of the time as well, as long as there's plentiful energy. And those would be the tier three loads, the 75% and at least 25% of the time. So making sure that we tier loads and that we have load management solutions to properly do that is super important. And that, that exists not only at at a single site, you know, behind the meter for solar microgrid type of thing, but also community microgrid, obviously your hospitals, your, your fire stations, et cetera, your emergency shelters, those, those facilities need to be kept on. And, and, the, and the critical loads at those facilities are the most important across the entire community. And by the way, UCSB is the, 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 the um, emergency sheltering site for all of Santa Barbara County. So it's the, it's the primary sheltering site emergency sheltering site for all of Santa Barbara County. So not only is this a very important site, you know, because it's a university, it's got a lot of critical loads in its in and of itself, but it also has uh, an emergency sheltering function for the broader community. Thanks, Craig. Um, excellent. So uh, next, I'd like to go to Carrie. And, and Carrie, I know you've, met, you've seen the chart. What's your take on microgrids? Who are, who are you, by the way? And why are you here? And then, um, what do you think is a very critical innovation or policy change that's needed? After that, Carrie, I'd like um, Dr. Auer to speak. 
And then we'll we'll end with in our opening remarks with Josh and Stephanie, both of whom uh, represent load serving entities, which is often a you know, really critical player here. So um, Carrie, uh, Dr. Auer, and then Josh and Stephanie, please go yeah. ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Bentley. I'm the CEO of Gridwell Consulting. I say we do all things energy in the West. Um, my really role in microgrids, um, I'll just jump off of what Craig was saying. Actually, it's if you imagine that chart he had, he had it for UCSB. And you could develop those individual charts for all different areas. And the amount of load in the different tiers varies. And so what we are doing for many companies is we're helping them identify the storage technology that meets these different tier needs. So I know your example was for solar, um, but we work with new battery technologies a lot um, and new different long duration storage needs. So we're helping different CCAs, for example, evaluate these different technologies to meet their own potential needs. Um, a lot of the focus has been on the IOUs, of course, um, and they're the main ones who are using this for PSBS um, and trying to use the microgrid incentive program for testing new technologies. But really what will happen over time is that these new technologies will make their way for grid scale reliability. So we're trying to pick the right technology, just not for the individual communities and helping companies evaluate this on you know, an individual community level, but also say, okay, what is this teaching us about grid resiliency at all? And which of these programs can be moved up um, and scaled even more? Um, so, you know, it's really more on the technology side, but it, what Craig was saying was very interesting. I look forward to talking more. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And um, Dr. Auer, please go ahead with your, um, uh, just please reintroduce yourself and um, share what you think one of the key innovations needs to be. Sure. Thank you. So, again, my name is Sabina Auer. I'm CEO of Elena International. It's a two-year-old startup by now. Um, I think I was also supposed to say why I'm why I'm here I, because of my 12 years of experience in renewable energy, um, in the renewable energy sector, and um, I did my dissertation also on uh, renewable power grids and their stability with uh, high shares of renewables, especially. So I simulated renewable power grids. I also planned renewable power systems in the past, and. Um, I guess because of this background, also my answer is, is re related to that one. Innovation is critical to enabling renewable microgrids. So I think um, from my perspective, the optimal planning is still, in ch is a still a challenge. So to find an adequate abstraction level for all different technologies um, that have their technical detail, their strengths and weaknesses, and to abstract them um, on a level that you can actually optimize um, the whole system and find an optimal full system solution. And this means across the sectors. And as Craig also mentioned, was, um, he also referred to me, the, the load management is also something that's often uh, not included in the planning process. And um, then, I, I, of course, it also depends. And I want to distinguish here if we look at grid connected microgrids or uh, microgrids that are also supposed to be standalone, because uh, one of the great challenges I see in Standard on microgrids is the stability aspect, um, the grid stability aspect, the frequency stability, especially with the high. So, from my side, it looks like uh, Dr. Auer's audio froze. Do you guys see that as well? Okay, so hopefully she'll come back in just a moment. Um, obviously, her experience is very relevant here, so she'll be back. Um, but I wanted to, we, so we've talked about the innovations of microgrids, but I wanted to now shift over to Stephanie and Josh. Um, and you guys are in the roles of load serving entities. Um, and when the lights go off, I'm guessing you guys more than others get yelled at. And so um, I wanted to hear your uh, sort of opening statements on what innovations are critical for enabling microgrids and also who you are and why you're here. So. Um, Josh, do you mind going first and then Stephanie? Is that okay? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you clearly. Thank you. All right. Good uh, Good morning or good evening, depending where you are. So uh, my role is I, I manage a team called uh, Grid Edge Innovation at Southern California Edison. Uh, it's an engineering team, and we lead uh, pilot and demonstration projects that generally have to do with how we can better leverage uh, DERs and how we plan or distributed energy resources and how we plan and operate the grid that includes, but is not limited to uh, microgrids. And I'd say over the last 18 months, give or take the microgrids have 
you know, kind of growing in, in the in importance and level of attention. And, and so my team has progressively gotten more involved. Uh, I think I'm here just in general, maybe to help provide a, a utility perspective. Um, a little more specifically, we do have a couple of projects that that uh, I think help give me some insight here when we're developing a, a potential community scale microgrid in an area that's been particularly impacted by uh, public safety power shutoffs that are that have you know performed uh, in response to wildfire conditions. Uh, we have another, I think, a little more advanced technologically project uh, where we want to work with a, a city government or county government to more tightly integrate how we can operate the city government uh, resources and utility resources together in order to optimize the operation of a, of a community scale microgrid that supports uh, uh, critical loads. Josh, uh, as far as technological innovations. Yeah, I just um, wanted to, I to focus on your remark right there. I, what I heard yeah. you say is that coordination among government entities could be a really critical part of enabling microgrids. Is that a fair summary of it? It, it yes, uh, thank you. I, um, I like how you said it better than me, but yeah, it's absolutely a, an important uh, a component and, uh, and, and it's challenging, right? The more cooks you get in the kitchen, the more you know people involved. You have different stakeholders with different perspectives, and and you, you know, in addition to developing the technology, you have to talk about, you know, where does the equipment go, and is that aesthetically pleasing, and and is everyone who's going to be affected want to look at that? And and uh, from an engineer's perspective, you might not worry about those things, but they end up being very very important about whether. You know, it can really affect really whether a project moves forward or not. We, our panel represents the just the casual um, German or Californian who would visually see a microgrid and may not like it. Um, we may have more of an engineering grid reliability orientation on this panel. But Josh, you were, right. I'm sorry to cut you off. You were about to say a technology innovation, and then I'd like to hear from Stephanie. Sure. I, and two things come to mind when I think about innovation and, and technology. One is on the planning side. So one of the things that we've been we've been doing is, you know, looking across our service territory, which includes about 4,500 distribution circuits, we have 5 million customers, and, and trying to holistically identify where could microgrids make sense. Um, and in the context of all the other work that we're planning, we're doing all kinds of things that are helping to improve reliability, improve resiliency, reduce the frequency and impact of public safety, power shutoffs, and other things that affect customers. There's a lot going on, and how do you? How can we more holistically but efficiently identify where the opportunities are, and quickly evaluate those? Uh, we we need to further develop our planning tools and processes in order to enable that. Right now, honestly, it, it's it's labor intensive, um, which which I think is to be expected to some extent because it's it's relatively new for us. So so I think there's opportunity to to see innovation there from on a planning side, and then. Okay. Once those opportunities are identified, what I think uh, what I think is really important is having compact zero emission generation storage technologies uh, that are also cost effective. I think you know finding the physical space and then developing a project that will be cost effective and provide you know multi day runtime capabilities when islanded which is the type of capability we like to see if we're thinking about, you know, natural disaster type events. That's really tough to, to do with today's technology. Uh, so, yeah, so I think said, lots of room there. Zero emissions, um, good looking and um, yeah. sort of dense footprint. So we'll come back to you in a moment with some of those um, because um, Craig talked about the, the multi-day and Sabina also. Um, is that necessary? We'll talk about that in a moment. But hey, let's Alex, Alex, before you go, before you leave, Josh, I'd, I'd just like to offer, uh, Josh, we, we need to uh, we need to get connected because the California has a teed up opportunity for a community microgrid, exactly like what you're talking about, full on, you know, solar driven community microgrid, which has lots of energy storage in it. And um, and that is in the Santa Barbara region. So it includes uh, the UCSB uh, campus and, and lots of uh, critical facilities in the in the vicinity, which is really close to the Goleta, the Goleta substation, which I'm sure you know, super transmission grid vulnerable because it's got a single connection yeah. through 40 miles of super vulnerable transmission grid. 
right? Yep. We'll Lots of interesting that. things going on up there. Yep. Okay. Um, and so, Stephanie, um, thanks for being here. I look forward to your opening remarks of why you're here and who you're with, and also what innovation is important. If, if you're okay with it, I'd like you to emphasize though the role of CCAs in all of this and how you guys represent a growing body of um, individual citizens who may not understand the electric system very well and just want their lights on. So if you could share about that, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alex. So I'm Stephanie Tannenhaus. I'm on East Bay Community Energy's policy team. And so um, the term community choice aggregator or CCA has been mentioned a, a few times now. EBCE is one of those. So we're a, a local electricity provider that serves 14 different cities in and around Alameda County. Um, so we provide the electricity, but as uh, Rachel mentioned, um, we don't own the distribution infrastructure. Um, the uh, investor-owned utilities or IOUs um, are, you know, have have that oversight. So, um, so you know, our, our mission is is to be able to provide our customers with low carbon, cost effective electricity. Um, you know, we are want to integrate innovative energy services in order to maximize the local benefits. So, um, you know, definitely a, a strong emphasis on our the communities themselves. Um, so, you know, because of that, we're, we're sort of consistently looking for different opportunities uh, to invest in our communities and offer programs for the, the different challenges they face. And um, resilience is, of course, one of those uh, one of those big and, and growing challenges. Um, so that's that's been a, a focus of ours, but we have to do it in in a way that, um, you know, that, that we have control over. Um, so you know, I can talk about some of the, the programs that uh, that we're working on right now uh, in a little bit. But I'd say you know, when it comes to sort of challenges and, and need for innovation, I completely agree with with Josh that um, the the policy and regulatory arena pr often presents a, a barrier for us, um, especially where the policy constructs have been changing dramatically and, and that affects the economics of these, these local projects. Um, so, you know, really alongside technology innovations and, um, and you know, cost reductions, I think innovations in, in program design um, and sort of the, the regulatory paradigm um, that are able to maximize all of the benefits to, to EBCE and to the customers that we serve um, you know, that's what really allows us to move forward in this space. Okay, and we're going to talk about that a lot. And I think if it's okay with you guys, it sounds like uh, community microgrids are, are sort of maybe a topic that's more, a bit more complicated and something we should focus on. But just to get the panel going, because we, we don't have too much time, the, the perhaps the most important question I can ask, and I'll, maybe I'll start with you, uh, Sabina, and you, Carrie, and I'm looking for provocative answers here. Um, who is better with microgrids and why? Is it the Germans or the Californians? And that's, again, the most important question. And then we'll go into some technical discussion there. No one's going to take the bait, huh? Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I like to answer. I like to answer that in that I, I, I have to admit, I don't know what's going on in Germany, but I I'm, would very much like to come over and take a look. But maybe I need to wait for COVID to get a little more under control. I'd, I'd love to come visit. Yeah, and to the Germans out there, if if possible, you know, hopefully Craig will convince Josh to do a microgrid in Santa Barbara, which is a very beautiful part of the state, and all the Germans should come over and go visit Santa Barbara, because that's a nice place to spend time. Mm -hmm. right. And and Alex, I'm going to take a, 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 just a, a stab at kind of a predecessor to your answer, which is the Germans, the Germans get so much credit for moving the world into this energy transition. By by bringing together the the, the feed-in tariff that they introduced, you know, over ten years ago, and uh, well, actually, it's almost like fifteen years, maybe more than fifteen years ago. But that was a game changer for the world of solar, right? And getting solar to scale. Um, so a huge thank you to Germany on that. 
Uh, also, they, they, they have done, like nowhere else, at least nowhere in the United States, they've fixed the, the, the issues of interconnection. They've just required that these projects need to be interconnected. Those costs get socialized for, for distribution interconnected projects, which is really different than the way it works in the United States. And, and interconnection has been a massive barrier to getting these projects really unleashed in the United States. So Germany has done so much of the groundwork that, that allows for uh, renewables driven microgrids to be what they are going to be in the near future. Uh, and, 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 and so a huge thank you to Germany um, where they stand on microgrids specifically, I'm not as familiar, but I do know that they've laid the groundwork that is that is uh, unleashing the unleash the fundamentals that are required for these renewables driven microgrids to be successful. Thanks, Craig. Thanks. Yeah, so Craig, maybe I also want to comment now because I had some time to think about it. So I think um, innovation wise, there was a lot of work as uh, as Craig also said that has been done in Germany and also the the first percent of um, you know the transition got kicked off and there are a lot of single family houses equipped with solar power plants that you see there are a lot of industry um, buildings and so on um, but now i think there's actually a little bit of a barrier in the multi-family multi-family sector and the tenant houses because their ownership is a really big problem in regulation and um, yeah I, I i think that there would be a big push necessary but it's not coming yet so this tenant electricity project for example we work more in switzerland at the moment because um it's it's easier there so the um the investment security there for investors is given so projects are more kicked off there um there, there are still projects in germany but i think it would have much more of a boost if there would be some more regulatory um changes We'll, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but let me jump over to you, Josh. So the, the previous technology innovation sessions focused on, you know, I'm summarizing the like cleaner, smarter, better than what we've historically seen, um, you know, clever solutions, technology capabilities coming to bear uh, more efficient solar generation and whatnot. So in light of that, like, where, do you think there are still barriers to microgrids that as you with as Southern California Edison, which is one of the largest utilities in the world, um, how are you guys seeing microgrids deploy, particularly on the community side and um, what barriers still exist that we should all think about? Sure. So, I, and it's on the community side, you know, it's still very, very early days as, you know, we've heard some comments that the, you know, the the regulations are still evolving. There's a what's called a rulemaking at the Utilities Commission that's ongoing that where many of the issues that need to be addressed for community scale microgrids have yet to be addressed, but but there's progress. So so it's a little hard to be too specific now because the you know the the landscape's still evolving. I, I think you know we already talked about generation storage technology. Um, and again, I, I think that's important, cheaper, more compact, um, and, you know, with zero emissions. Other things that come to mind is we, um, when we think about how we um, protect equipment and people uh, in the event of um, fault conditions, uh, the way we do that today is based on the, on the old grid design, the central power uh, distributed to customers when we have microgrids that, that's not going to work anymore so we need to develop new ways of protecting equipment and people and there's you know there's real safety implications of that on that subject i don't know I, from a technology standpoint I, you know we may we may have much of the equipment available to us that we would need to do that but but the controls will need to evolve the algorithms will will need to evolve so i think there's there's work on the software side that needs to happen there and and as we start doing these projects in the, in the field will gain the experience we need to establish how best to do that. I think another thing that's interrelated with that on from a, again on the communication and control side just in you know, beyond protection just in general integrating customer owned and third party owned systems with utility systems where there has to where that integration is necessary in order for everything to function um, that that can be a long you know labor intensive process and that and that hits the bottom line of the project right so for projects to become more economic we have to get better at integrating 
so that we can work through that, you know, through that uh, more quickly. I think the term plug and play is a nice aspirational term. I, I don't know that we'll get there in my lifetime, but it's got to be, you know, plug in and play sooner than than we can today. And, and I think there's room for improvement there over time. But while maintaining one of the challenges there too, though, the tension, there's a tension between making that quick and easy while maintaining cybersecurity. So we're going to have to think about cybersecurity as we as we think about how to integrate. Okay, so safety, cybersecurity, and it sounds like standardization may help. Um, you know, it, I represent absolutely. the art industry and you know, financing is a reality, a real problem. So having standard products that lenders are comfortable with may help. It also can bring costs down. So um, maybe Craig or Stephanie, if, if that's what Edison's seeing, how do we, what solutions can we bring to bear? Can we offer standard solutions based on typical tier one loads and, and sort of orient a system towards a standard product? And Sabine, I don't know if that's doable, but I'm just sort of trying to probe if that's possible or would work. And, and Stephanie, you could think about if that would work for your customers. And then Carrie, you could also think about if that is something that could then support the larger electric system on a regular basis and be monetized. Uh, maybe. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the starting point is to um, fix interconnection. Okay. And the interconnection issue is, is a problem uh, behind the meter, but even more so like 100 times harder in front of the meter. And the Clean Coalition actually has uh, multiple projects going on right now where we want to interconnect front of meter and do it in a way that will provide resilience to specific facilities on, on you know, within a, within a, um, a, a local grid area. At, but we can't even do it front of meter and provide resilience to the, to the site where the solar's up on the roof and, and, and solar parking canopies on that parking lot, right? It just happens to be interconnected in front of the meter. And, uh, and that's gotta be fixed. It's just, it's, I, excuse me, but it's just stupid. Right, and and if there are California policymakers in this conversation today, you know they should be taking notes on this. We've got to fix interconnection, and we've got to fix it for front of meter, so that we can get we can maximize the the, the solar siting potential on a site. A lot of times, you have a, a a site that has a big parking lot. You want to stack that up. You want to stack up the roof. And you're going to have way more solar than you need for that one site. But guess what? That, that site is right next to a bunch of other big sites that maybe don't have solar siting opportunity, but have massive loads. And you need that solar to flow to those other, those other facilities. But when the grid goes down, you need to be able to isolate an island, a, a distribution grid area, right? So that the solar and the storage can work together and provide resilience to your critical community facilities. That, that we need the innovation uh, for that to happen. And um, for, for that, the starting point is to make sure that we can fix the interconnection, um, the front of meter interconnection and, uh, and, 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 and interconnection in general. There's also interconnection issues for behind the meter. Yeah, but that, exactly. is, that is one of the first things we need to do. No, I totally hear you. Can you just say what you think fixed looks like? So uh, you have this parking lot you've mentioned that's relevant for a potential community microgrid. What, what's the interconnection rule you would like to see? And then Josh, maybe you can react about sort of from the utility side with its safety and other hats, cybersecurity hat. How does, where does that work or not work? So go ahead, Craig, just one, one final comment to paint that picture for us. Yeah, well, we've got, a, we've got a live project in the middle of San Francisco, massive load area, right? It's at a, it's at a uh, low income and senior living um, uh, apartment complex, hundreds of, hundreds of apartment units. The site already has, a, has, has enough solar on the rooftops that to, to provide for 80% of net zero, right? We get 80% of net zero of that entire site from the solar that's already there. We're trying to attach a battery to front a meter at that site, right? It's, it's on, this battery is on that apartment complex property, but it's interconnected in front of the, the meters. Like there's hundreds of meters, right? Cause there's hundreds of units. Each unit has its own meter. We're, we're gonna interconnect the battery in front of that meter. We got what's called fast track approval, front of meter fast track approval, which means that it has negligible grid impact, right? Our, our battery is gonna have negligible grid impact, fast track interconnect, 
It's taken us two years and we're still not done. This is so-called fast track in California. And in addition, now I can't blame Southern California Edison for this one, but I got a handful of examples for Southern California Edison that are very similar to this. <laughs> so Ed Edison's not off the hook, but this happens to be in San Francisco, which is PG&E. And PG&E uh, basically came out and said, this is fast track. It's going to cost you $85,000 to do this interconnection, all the grid upgrades and everything else that's required. Two years later, guess what that price is? $350,000. Okay. They just like, they scope creeped it. They, they put all sorts of additional requirements in place as time went along. And guess what? The difference between 85,000 and 350,000 is more than a quarter million dollars on a battery project that is only 500 kilowatts one megawatt hour, right? It's 500 kilowatt, two hour energy capacity battery. This is a tiny little battery and it's gonna cost $350,000 on a project that shouldn't cost more than about a million dollars to deploy total. I mean, this is just crazy. So the solution is, Alex, to your, to your core question, the solution is that we have to have fast track interconnections need to be uh, you need to have an estimate from the utility what that interconnection cost is going to be, okay. and then the utility has to live with any any increase to that, right? So when they told us eighty five thousand dollars, tell us one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Tell us whatever you think it is, but then don't come and put another two hundred fifty thousand dollars on it two years later. That's just insane. Okay, so and, more and straightforward pricing and faster interconnection. Um, and Josh, how far are we from having that be a reality? I, I honestly, I, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Okay. I, you know, I, I hear the, you know, I hear the frustration. I, it, it's, I'll acknowledge it. It is challenging. You know, we have, we have projects that, that we're doing within the utility that are affected by the same, you know, the same consideration. So, so I understand. I just, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with, you know, what the underlying factors of, of, you know why it takes that long and you know in that particular case of pg and &E, why the cost went up so much i think one this is speculative i don't know if it if it relates to that project or not but i think it does raise an interesting question that's relevant for microgrids which is when a customer or a microgrid developer who's serving multiple customers is doing a project that benefits that one customer or a few customers those those, you know, typically and historically, you know, the customers would pay the cost of any grid upgrades that that, that project would would drive, right? And, and the reason for that is to prevent what's called cost shifting. Um, and that comes up in microgrids as well, right? So if, we're, if a microgrid project is driving or requires that we make some upgrade elsewhere to the grid, it's only benefiting those microgrid customers you know, to what extent should other utility customers pay for that? I think that's one of the issues that's being addressed through the um, through the rulemaking that's ongoing at the Utilities Commission, and it's an important uh, you know topic for microgrids in general. You know, how who pays for what? You're on mute, uh, Craig. Yeah, I just want to share this this uh, little diagram because it, it shows this particular project. This project benefits the entire grid area. In fact, it's partially funded by the California Energy Commission in order to increase the solar hosting capacity of the feeder circuit, right? So it's it's on a 12 kilovolt feeder circuit. The Valencia Gardens Apartments is here. It's hundreds of hundreds of units. That I've said here's a photograph of it. It's already got stacks of solar on its rooftop. The solar is interconnected front of meter as well, by the way. It's but it's through a program that facilitated that called a MASH program. We're adding this battery right here. It is it is front of meter interconnection. It's helping the entire feeder. The entire feeder is going to increase its solar hosting capacity by 25% as a consequence of this battery being installed. And, and so it's not, it's not just benefiting the Valencia Gardens apartments, it is benefiting the entire feeder, the entire grid area. Um, and, and this is the type of project that needs to be happening all over the place. If I understood Josh's introduction correctly, I mean, this is, this is what Josh's role is all about, is to bring these kind of projects to life. Again, this project is in San Francisco, pg and &E service territory, but Clean Coalition has dozens of projects just like this that we want to do in Southern California Edison service territory. So Josh, I, we need to talk. We need to, we need to facilitate these types of projects and make them happen. 
Yeah, I think um, a key here is sort of that the criteria for determining who pays and is there a cost shift. Um, and I think maybe another action item would be, Josh, and again, you, you highlighted it. it um, can we get more sophisticated with understanding that um, in Craig's microgrid case, it looks like it really does benefit the whole community or bigger than that. So there, the argument that there's a cost shift is sort of diminished from my point of view, but certainly there are other cases where that's still a relevant issue from the utility standpoint. Um, so Alex, and I'll, I'll just make one more case here. I mean, I think everybody can agree that hospitals, fire stations, emergency shelters, those are all critical community facilities. They benefit everybody to make sure that those facilities have, have you know, resilience. And, and I will argue that places like the Valencia Gardens Apartments where you've got low income senior uh, residents, these are people, we got hundreds of people that live in that apartment complex that are vulnerable. If there's a major grid outage, the last thing you wanna do is spend first responders time taking those people from a place where they could easily be sheltered in place to clog up beds at an emergency sheltering, uh, at a community emergency shelter, right? That would just be silly. So in a sense, that vulnerable community, by making sure that it has energy resilience, becomes an emergency shelter for a super vulnerable population that is extremely simple to shelter in place by simply just getting the micro, you know, the community microgrid structure correct. Yeah, and I think this highlights again, back to the planning question. So uh, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, everybody. So I wanted to go around and see if people had a closing statement um, and Emily, if you could join us up on stage, because um, I will need to leave, but maybe you can stay. And if people are interested, we can continue to have a little discussion here. Um, so um, Stephanie and, and Sabina and Carrie, did you guys want to make a, any closing statements? Um, I'd like to respond to Craig really quick. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so, you know, uh, I work a lot with the interconnection at the IOUs and talk to the people individually. And my clients face what you face all the time the delays and upgrades, um, you could fast track it. But then if you fast track it, they don't really evaluate your interconnection up front. So you may get a wildly inaccurate number. And when we really explored changing these policies, there's a trade-off. Um, basically, if you want a better number up front, you have to then evaluate the project more carefully and that's gonna increase your initial interconnection cost, which may prohibit you know, good projects from moving forward. So I agree that the rules need to be changed. Um, I think the delays are pretty unacceptable at this point. Um, completely agree there, but I think we do have to evaluate the trade-offs in changing these rules. And I know your project was completely off base on the cost estimates, but to get a really good cost estimate that takes a lot of work and that takes a lot of costs. And so I think there's just a trade-off that regulators and IOUs are working through. Um, more generally, I think too, this trade-off applies to microgrids more than anything else, right? You have trade-offs and cost shifting between different consumers. And then you have trade-offs between the technologies you use. Is it short-term resiliency for wildfires that you're trying to do? Or is it long-term resiliency for, you know, these day-long infinite, you know, I don't know, potential disasters where you want 10% of your load at all times? And making those microgrid decisions, I, I think it's fascinating, one of the, the hardest places to work in our industry, honestly and most exciting. Yeah, thanks. Um, Sabina and Stephanie, go ahead, Stephanie. Thanks, yeah, just um, wanted to, to uh, briefly tie into, you know, what, what Craig mentioned about uh, hospitals. So, uh, what, you know, one approach that EBC is taking to improve community resilience is partnering directly with our, our member cities and helping them to identify what, what the critical municipal facilities are. Um, and these are facilities that are you know, designated to, uh, to help serve communities in times of emergencies or grid outages. Um, so on, under that model, EBCE is actually, you know, we're contracting with the city to provide them with solar and storage systems. And then we're contracting with developers directly you know, to procure that. Um, so, you know, from, so that sort of reduces risk and, and that then allows for, for cost savings and really, you know, in, enables these cities to move forward, um, you know, with, with kind of a, a portfolio of projects that overall will help to build up that community resilience. So um, I guess that it just sort of underscores that there's, there's uh, you know, obviously no, no one size fits all or, or no sort of uniformity in terms of 
uh, what a microgrid is and, and uh, what it looks like. But I think that um, there are definitely op opportunities for innovation on, in technology as, as well as um, kind of the, the policy regulatory, the, the process that is that we have to integrate these systems. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a definitely exciting to, to hear these different perspectives. Thank you okay, so much. Then. I'm actually quickly going to pass to Josh as he needs to leave um, in, a, in a second too. So Josh, perhaps a quick, quick closing remark. Sure, sure. First, you know, thanks for the opportunity. Good and interesting discussion. Um, and apologies, but I do have to get off here in a minute. Um, the one other thing that comes to mind, just thinking about the what the spirit of this meeting is, and the and the the companies that are have presented and interested in pursuing opportunities here in California, you know, from <clears throat> Uh, just a little advice in, in doing business uh, with the utility. Uh, well, there's probably a lot I could say about that, but but in particular, you know, if if we're if we're leading on a project like a microgrid type project or a large energy storage project, you know, our preference is to transact with, and we'll pretty much always transact with with the vendor that's really pulling the whole thing together, um, and then that vendor will subcontract out whatever they need in order to deliver us a turnkey system. So I think it's, a, it's important for um, companies that would like to do business with us to kind of get a, have a clear vision of you know, what their contribution is and what they feel their scope of supply is. And depending on what that is, you, know, you, might, not be, you, know, you might not be transacting with us directly. You might be transacting with, with a, a project developer that's pulling various technologies together and, and then who's then working with us to give us a turnkey, you know, system or service. So um, I, I wanted to share that because I, I oftentimes we get in conversations with vendors that have very interesting technology to us, but but I think the, you know, there are probably two or three degrees of uh, separation away from us as far as where they fit in the value chain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh, again, and I know you have to go. So a big thank you to you as well for joining the panel. And thank we're you. just going to keep wrapping up here as well. I know. Yeah, and Emily, I also need to run. I apologize. Um, so I, um, Sabina and Craig, I'll, I'll miss your closing remarks. I'm, I'm really sorry, but I hope to hear back from you and connect. And to all the audience members, thank you. It was great to be here. Um, please check out CISA if you're not familiar with us, and um, we'd love to work with you all. Um, Emily, appreciate it. It's been great working with you. So I uh, wish you wish you the best and we'll be in touch. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, for this really great moderation panel and for your opening remarks. Talk to you very soon again. And I do still want to hear from our last panelist with the closing remarks. Um, so passing on to you, I think, Zabina, you're next. Thank you, Emily. Also, thanks, Alex, or, or I think you just already dropped out. So my closing remark, I would, um, yeah, I wanted to start also saying that I think there's already much innovation technologies in place. Um, I think there's also continuous positive progress, so I'm, I'm really sure of that. I, I think one of the challenges is how to properly use uh, the technologies we have at hand, at hand how to plan. And what already, already came up quite a lot also from my side is also a, a bit of changes in regulation. So especially because historically we have a centralized system and I agree um, with Carrie that this needs rule changes. Um, if, we, if we think of more of a decentralized system, um, there are questions like who pays for the grid? And um, if, this, if the system gets more and more decentralized and um, um, people consume their own energy within the small communities who's paying for the bigger continental grid and grid charges etc is something that needs to be adjusted also to make microgrids a good business case and i think this is something um that that still needs a bit of push that the good business case of a microgrid in some areas okay thank you so much really good point and it was really great to hear perspectives from germany as well in this um in this panel and conference Cray, I think you will have the last closing word here before I wrap up and give a couple of just closing remarks as well. And uh, thank you again for staying a little bit longer. It was such an interesting discussion. It was really great to hear and for you to be able to stay a little bit longer. Great. Well, thank you, Emily. <clears throat> the, uh, so my, my closing remarks, I'll, I'll keep them very pointed. And, and it really uh, emphasases some of the things I've already been talking about and em emphasizing, I think, multiple times. And that is that we, we need to fix this, this interconnection issue. 
um, in California. Uh, and, and, and the solution is not that hard. It's the Germans have already done it. The Germans did it when they implemented their feed and tariff program because a fundamental part of the German feed and tariff program was to fix the interconnection. And in the German approach, the utilities simply pay for the interconnection upgrade costs. So there is no there is no uncertainty around the, the interconnection costs. The, the interconnection costs that are uncertain are all on the utility side. Well, in, in the German approach, the utility has to pay for those and they get socialized through the, 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 the German, um, the tariffs that the German utilities, um, you know, pay, uh, charge for retail electricity. So, they, they, so now California is probably not going to go to that same extent. So let's not try to, you know, let's not try to hope too far. But where the Californians should be able to go is for critical community facilities that in the cases where these 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 microgrids and 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 you know the underlying assets the solar and the storage that are being deployed at community critical community facilities or that will benefit critical community facilities if they're being interconnected within the area of those facilities and they'll be configured to provide resilience and other benefits to those critical community facilities in those cases the utilities should for sure pay for the grid upgrades. And by the way, that's a benefit to the utilities. Utilities in the United States, whether California or anywhere else in the United States, they make money by making capital expenditures. So this is actually a benefit to the utilities that they will get to make those capital expenditures and take a tremendous amount of risk and uncertainty off of the developers so that these projects will actually get, get deployed. And, uh, and I think that's the key innovation that needs to happen. And by the way, the Clean Coalition has a, uh, a workshop that we are conducting in partnership with the California Energy Commission on May 20th. Um, maybe I could ask one of the Clean Coalition team members who's on here to put into the chat uh, the link for that, that, uh, that webinar that's coming up on May 20th. It's, a, it's a, gonna be a, 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 um, a workshop with you know a virtual workshop with the California Energy Commission specifically on this issue and specifically uh, initiated because of that project that I talked about earlier uh, called the Valencia Gardens uh, Energy Storage Project at the apartment complex in San Francisco. So um, we got a lot of fixes we need to do. Yeah. No, thank you so much. That was really great. We actually are going to also going to be sending out a follow up email um, just for everyone to know with a recording of this conference and our previous conference on Tuesday, uh, where we can also include any information you would like that's open to all the panelists as well. And we can provide opportunity to meet some of the German companies to really expand on this exchange, because that's really what I'm taking from this uh, symposium is the really incredible potential to uh, connect between California and Germany to learn from each other and really to push microgrids to the next level. And so from my side, all I can really say so is a huge thank you to all of you panelists, all our speakers from Josh, Carrie, Stephanie, Craig, Zabina, and of course, Alex, who moderated this fantastically. Then as well, our German companies, Frecon, Heliotech, Sun Oyster, Easy Smart Grid, Laura Schalach, of course, and Rachel McMahon from Sunrun. Thank you so much for joining us. I think uh, increasing this collaboration, exchanging best practices and seeing how we can make microgrids and resilient uh, energy systems our, our future is really key here. Thank you so much for joining us. Also to our partners still, Clean Coalition, uh, CISA, World Trade Center LA, Plug and Play Energy, and Greater Sacramento Economic Council. We're really glad to have you on board. Looking forward to our next event, our next symposiums coming up. We'll keep you um, in the loop and send a follow-up email with all the PDFs of the presentations and contact information. So without further ado, thank you so much again and have a happy Easter and great weekend too.